need. Tsunami drills became a regular feature of life. Everyone knew what to do when the sirens sounded. On March the 11th, all along the coast, the sirens did sound, this time for real. Go to the hill. A tsunami was coming. This was not a drill. You hear the sirens? There's a hill outside of town that we're uh, going to try to get to. Uh, well, it's a precautionary measure, but, uh, I mean, you know, you never know. This this uh, town has a lot of history with tsunamis and a lot of death from it, so they're taking it pretty seriously, obviously. The warning saved the lives of some. This footage captures the moments after the sirens sounded. Here it comes! Tsunami breached the coastal defences. Miyako's high walls proved useless. Countless people died here. The tsunami was 10 meters high. Why did their 10 meter high walls fail to stop it? With thousands of sensors along the coastline, the scientists already have part of the answer. The fact that the shoreline has actually subsided means that the sea had plenty of space to go and it, it basically filled up the empty space left by the sinking. Several villages have just been completely ruined with no survivors and the human death toll is obviously going to be up in the tens of thousands when, when the final count is in. The data from the sensors had revealed something incredible. The earthquake had caused the whole coastline to drop by up to a meter, lowering Miyako's walls, making the tsunami much worse. All along the coast, subsidence put towns in danger. You've got the tsunami wave coming in. Uh, on top of what would be uh, essentially a two meter higher vacuum of subsided land as it as it sweeps in and there's not much to stop it until it hits a hits higher ground somewhere but most at risk was the shut down nuclear power plant to Fukushima it had survived the earthquake and here too there was a 5.6 meter defense wall but now it had sunk over half a meter Forty minutes after the quake, the wave smashed over the wall and flooded the diesel generators that were cooling the reactor cores. Backup batteries kicked in. Batteries with just an eight-hour charge. With thousands already confirmed dead. And now the threat of a nuclear disaster. Japan was in crisis. At 2.46 on Friday the 11th of March, Japan experienced its most powerful earthquake for a thousand years. A magnitude 9 quake shattered the land. Then a huge tsunami engulfed it. No! 
Overnight, fires raged across a sea-flooded wasteland. Oil from factories and gas from ruptured lines set hundreds of square kilometers of debris ablaze. In Tokyo, the train system was paralyzed. Millions bedded down in offices and waited for dawn. Meanwhile, the tsunami wave was still spreading across the ocean at 800 kilometers an hour. Countries all around the Pacific Rim were watching the situation nervously. In Hawaii, the tsunami warning center was on full alert. Very quickly, we realized that, that this was this was basically the first big ocean crossing tsunami um, that had happened in 40 years. Frantically, they were trying to work out when and where the wave would strike next. At that point, we went to a Pacific-wide warning, which means another message, and now lots and lots of phone calls. State warning point. This is the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Hawaii issued an evacuation alert. People headed to higher ground. The wave that hit was one meter high. It caused damage, but thankfully the distance had weakened the wave. This time, no lives were lost. With the wave now fading, countries around the Pacific downgraded their alerts. But Japan awoke to a nightmare. Different parts of the shoreline had suffered different effects. Channel 4 journalist Callum McRae set off along the Japanese coast to compare the levels of destruction and discover how far-reaching the damage of the tsunami was. 